Sure. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. So um, uh, today we are going to have uh, Julian Emil uh, Gay, who is a professor at, at USC. And uh, Julian has been collaborating with us uh, with, uh, I mean, the, during the, the last year in helping creating standards for the paleoclimate uh, community. So um, uh, uh, today he is going to be working about the future of all things and uh, part, I guess the part of the work that, that we have been uh, doing together as well. So I'm very happy to have him today and I look very forward to, to hear uh, his slides and his presentation. All right, thanks for the introduction. My real name is actually Julien Emile J, but you can just call me Julian. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay, uh, and can you see my screen right now, the screen I'm sharing? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so uh, the idea when we started this with uh, Yolanda, who is a co-PI on this, um, sure this is progressing. Um, so Linked Earth is an EarthCube funded project. It's been going on now since 2015. Uh, and it's got a, as far as these EarthCube projects goes, I think a very nice balance between uh, ge geoscientists on one side and information scientists or intelligence artificial, sorry, artificial intelligence researchers on the other side. So we have three PIs, uh, Nick McKay, myself, and Yolanda Gill, who will be familiar to many of you here. Uh, Danielle is, of course, uh, one of the prime collaborators on the project from the ISI side. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge my postdoc, Deborah Kider, uh, who has been doing a lot of the heavy lifting, in particular in, uh, as a community liaison. And Varun Ratnakar has been working his magic behind the scenes to make sure the platform actually works. So let me start with a bit of a motivation for uh, those of you who are not geoscientists and sort of mo motivates the, the use of artificial intelligence in this field and what we've been doing. Hopefully, uh, hopefully the, the timing will be working out okay. Uh, I don't actually have... Um, much of a chronometer on this, so uh, for much of a timer going on, so please give me a, maybe a 10 minute warning or something sure. like that. Yep. Okay, that'll be good. All right, so what do giant geoscientists want? In most cases, they just want to do science. Uh, and one of the issues is that data really gets in the way. You know, it's known in the field as data friction. Uh, by some accounts, geoscientists sometimes spend up to 80% of their time formatting or accessing the data in the form that they want. Uh, and that is, of course, a huge waste of resources. And therefore, we think that in the 21st century, we should be able to do much better. And so can artificial intelligence assist with some of these tasks? And what does it take to get there? And in particular, one of the things that geoscientists, in particular in the field that I'm in, uh, the study of past climates, paleoclimatology. What most people have been trying to do lately is integrate more data. So it used to be that, you know, if you were a great paleoclimatologist, you would go out in the field and measure something and then you'd publish one record, it usually would be one time series. Uh, in fact, you know, one, one of the earliest papers by Emiliani in 1955 had three data points um, and it still made it to nature. Uh, but nowadays, you can't do that. Nowadays, you need many hundreds or even thousands of data points. And increasingly, you need integration. Uh, and that is integration from data that comes from various regions. So that's one example of different climate records coming from different regions, uh, from the Arctic to, the, to Antarctica. This is from a recent paper by a collaborator, Nearly Abram. Uh, increasingly, people want to integrate data from different sources, which is sort of lurking under this. So a lot of the data that you see uh, in these curves actually comes from very different types of archives. And I'll get to what we mean by that. But this, basically, there's data that comes from trees. There's data that comes from corals, from ice cores, from sediments that were cored in lakes or in marine environments. And so basically, 
all of these things have very different formats. They have very different uncertainties associated with them, different resolution. And so it's a challenge for the paleo community in general to integrate all of these. And increasingly as well, uh, and this is one example from my own research, the people want to integrate between data and models. And I guess that's probably a theme that uh, in this working group of ISGEO is fairly common, right? I know that that's the case in, in many fields uh, of the geosciences. So how do we get data to the point that we can do all these things? Because it certainly isn't there at this point. Uh, so here are the main messages I'll try to go through today, uh, which is that in the future, paleo will require more integration uh, and that will require more standardization. Uh, and that it was ostensibly a big motivation for linked earth. And that um, one of the ways that we, you know, this will feed back into the community and accelerate the spiral of inference uh, between data and models is for this, uh, the, the codes associated with these data to be open source. And I'll argue that once things are standardized, then it's much easier to start writing open source code and doing reproducible research. All right, so here's a motivation. Um, this is a paper from 2013 that was published by an international network of scientists called the PAGES 2K Network. Uh, PAGES is a scientific organization that's funded 50% um, by the US National Science Foundation and 50% by the Swiss Science Foundation. It's primarily a, uh, a scientific coordination enterprise. So PAGES doesn't actually fund any science, but it uh, funds workshops and it subsidizes essentially the coordination of scientists, much like uh, RCNs, you know, research coordination networks do in the US. And in 2013, uh, a group of, you know, a few dozen uh, researchers, actually I think they started in 2011 or so, uh, decided to synthesize all the data that was available about the, the temperature of the past 2000 years. And they ended up publishing this in uh, Nature Geoscience, which is a top journal in, in our field, obviously. Well, if you're, if you're an AI researcher, you may not know this, so uh, it's important to say. And that paper has actually, actually has you know, a very high score by the alternative metrics you know, in terms of what, how many times it's been cited, but how many times it's been viewed and downloaded and so on and so forth. So it's a highly visible paper. That's the result of a community endeavor of data integration fundamentally. And, you know, it, it became high profile uh, because it came to confirm that some claims that had been made uh, 15 years ago in a very famous paper by Michael Mann about the hockey stick were essentially still applicable. Uh, that, it, you know, the hockey stick study said essentially we were, this was the warmest decade or the, the, the last three decades of the 20th century were among the warmest if not the warmest in a thousand years, and this study ended up concluding uh, similarly. Um, so the study figured very prominently in the, the paleoclimate chapter of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report. It was cited 10 times in that, in that chapter. It was also cited in the Detection Attribution chapter. So this is the kind of very high profile science that paleo is contributing, or that paleo can contribute to climate assessments. Okay, so that's the point I'm trying to get at here. Uh, but that requires a lot of work by a lot of people. And one motivation behind linked Earth and EarthCube in general is to facilitate that, is to, to really reduce the data friction so that these kinds of collaborative uh, summative endeavors uh, can be accelerated and, and made a lot easier. So fast forward, uh, well, the broader context for this, of course, is that we want to, why do we study past climates in the first place? Well, a major reason is because we want to give context to recent climate trends. Uh, another big reason is that it provides an out of sample test for climate models. So climate models are often developed based on modern data, but uh, if you test them with paleo data that they have not seen, it's a true out of sample test. Uh, and sometimes they are used also to explore analogs to future warmings. So the study of past warm episodes may give us some idea of what happens on a planet as it warms up. 
And then finally, and this is particularly true of the, the climate of the past 2000 years, it allows to figure out how human societies reacted to climate change in a variety of conditions. And all of this requires ostensibly more integration. So fast forward to this year, um, we just uh, published an update to this Pages 2K synthesis. Uh, and this is something that Nick McKay, a co-PI on this grant, and myself has been very uh, uh, you know, intimately associated with because we're lead authors on the paper. And nowadays, this is what the database looks like for the Pages 2K project. And the point I'm trying to make here is that it's a fairly big amount of data by paleo standards, but by big data standards or, or by uh, you know, any kind of information science standards, this is trivial. I mean, all of this database fits on a thumb drive. Uh, so it's not big data per se, but I would call it broad data. Um, broad data in the sense that it's very diverse. It comes from a variety of locations. There's a lot of different types of uh, archives. Uh, they range in resolution from monthly to centennial. Uh, the length ranges from about 50 years to 2,000 years. So, and they come from all kinds of different environments in the world from the tropics to the poles. Uh, and the biggest challenge here was not you know, finding a way to store or process that data. It was really finding a way to store it in a way that algorithms or computers could understand. Now, I'll, you know, I'll fast forward a little bit, but I'll tell you a little bit more about how we did that later on in this lecture. Uh, but the end result and what we wanted to do with this was something like this, which is to update that curve of temperature over the past 2,000 years. And this is a very, very crude estimation of temperature from a very naive way of putting the data together. But because it's so simple, it's easy to explain. So we essentially just averaged all these data sets together uh, and we kind of bin them so that they all had same resolution. And lo and behold, you see something that looks like a hockey stick, you know, the very famous uh, curve published by Michael Mann. So, once again, uh, it doesn't matter what you do to the data, you find a hockey stick. And I have a link here on the lower part of the screen um, to a blog post that I wrote about this that kind of explains this in everyday terms. So hopefully, if you're interested, you can learn more about this without having to pour over uh, the paper, which, is, which was published in Scientific Data, so it's, it's pretty dry. I warn you. The blog post should be more entertaining. So where do we want to go with this? Well, we are already uh, doing some integration of this uh, with climate model data and with instrumental data. So I, I think that this is eventually where all of this is going, is that once we can put this data in a format that's much more uniform, standardized, then we can easily feed that data to modern algorithms. So this is one example that you see from a project I'm also associated with called the Last Millennium Reanalysis which is essentially doing for paleo what uh, data assimilation in weather forecasting is doing. So it's really fusing together models and data uh, to form a so-called analysis. Uh, so you know, a kind of a gridded estimate of what climate did over the past 2000 years. And I'm just showing you temperature here on the uh, upper graph. This is a global temperature with an estimate of uncertainties, which is of course incredibly important for assessments. And uh, on the bottom, you see some spatial estimates. So that's one thing that you can get with this that you couldn't get with just staring at the raw data is that you get an idea of what are the spatial patterns and what you're looking at in this case is the, the average response of the climate system to volcanic eruptions in two different data sets. So the LMR one is on the right. On the left, you have a much more sparse and kind of uh, bare bones assessments, but it's kind of remarkable that they, they show a lot of similarities. So the point I'm trying to make with this is that we're trying to move paleo data from where it used to be maybe 10 years ago or, or even longer, or up, up just a few years ago, which is individual investigators publishing a single time series uh, with some interpretation of saying, oh, well, I think my paleo record means this to now having many hundreds of records from many locations in the world, trying to bundle them together with state-of-the-art climate models and form uh, global scale assessments 
uh, over long periods of time. Now, of course, to get to that point, you need to have data sets that are standardized. And that's where we're going with Link Truth. Now, it requires quite a few more things than that. Uh, so this is one uh, slide that I won't go into, but I, I just want to give you an idea that it took an, an immense amount of coordination between uh, nine working groups, in this case, uh, covering the major land and ocean regions of the world, uh, to actually arrive at this data product. Uh, so, you know, there needed to be a lot of coordination and certification by co-authors. But there's also, more broadly speaking, um, a lot of ingredients to paleoclimatology that uh, information scientists may not be familiar with, so I just wanted to talk about this for a little bit. Uh, first of all, of course you have to, so we have primarily four big uh, ingredients. The first one is we need to sample the data, of course. And that requires a certain number of skills, which if you're looking at ocean-based data sets, these would be the skills on the left-hand side. Uh, then you need to analyze the data, and that requires also a, you know, different sets of skills like geochemistry, paleontology, and so forth. At the end of that, the end product of that, you have data analysis, which requires uh, skills that uh, like statistics, computer science, signal processing, etc. And then in between, there is this step uh, that we call data sharing, which really shouldn't take a whole lot of time, but ends up, as I said, consuming sometimes an enormous amount of time for paleoclimate researchers. Um, and you know, it's a good question of what skills did that actually require. Uh, in, in our uh, vision, it shouldn't require any skill. That part should just uh, basically disappear altogether. It should be replaced by robots, pretty much. Uh, or we're trying to get to a place where artificial intelligence can really reduce that step so that, you know, that's not something that paleo scientists have to spend any time on. So in the case of this Pages 2K update, uh, this is what we did. This was kind of like a prototype for how Linked Earth worked. We had all these working groups that ended up feeding a lot of their input and information into Google Sheets. So why Google? Well, because it's web-based, uh, and this is something that we had about 98 co-authors for this. So we needed a way uh, so that everybody could collaborate on these sheets, uh, on these spreadsheets, instead of what most people are still doing in this field, which is emailing Excel spreadsheets around, which is an anathema, but you know, still people do that. Uh, and then we needed to wrap that into a format uh, that, uh, to, to analysis. Um, and that is something that, again, that's a, sort of a format that we had to create pretty much for this purpose. Um, that, that's called the LIPID, which stands for Linked Paleo Data Format. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what it is. But it's essentially a bunch of TSV tables wrapped together with JSON, which stands for uh, JavaScript Object Notation. And then the, once you have your data into LIPID, and once it uh, kind of passes, muster on a number of quality control fronts, then you can start actually having fun. Then you can start feeding to uh, algorithms and doing science with it. And you can also uh, put it in the cloud and uh, into EarthCube in, uh, in a structured way. Uh, and that's the part ostensibly where uh, Linked Earth uh, was born from. So, you know, up to a few years ago, doing this kind of science would have seemed like science fiction. But remember that science fiction um, uh, often takes very little to acknowledge. So, you know, tablets used to be science fiction and computer uh, you know, portable phones used to be science fiction. And now we have a bunch of the things that were science fiction just a few years ago. Uh, and so Linked Earth, uh, again, is trying to manifest something like that, that by thinking boldly, uh, maybe we'll go to places we haven't been before. And so what are the components of Linked Earth? Uh, one component was to create a platform where paleoclimate scientists could curate their data in a much more reliable way. Uh, the second part was to use that platform to foster the development of standards for all the reasons that I said. And because we're interested in actually doing analysis with it, along that comes with the development of open source codes that use these standards or that really take advantage of these standardized data sets. So over the next few minutes, let me go through these different objectives and show you uh, what, uh, 
Danielle and Yolanda and, and the ISI group has built for us and, and how we're making it work for the community. So the main platform that we're using uh, takes the shape of an innocuous looking wiki. Uh, and I say innocuous because most of you hopefully have used Wikipedia before, so you're kind of familiar with the platform, but uh, under the hood, this wiki packs uh, a lot of AI punch. Uh, and that's, uh, that's one thing that Danielle can tell you a lot more about. Um, and in fact, uh, Yolanda and Danielle just uh, got a paper accepted in a, a conference of International Semantic Web Conference, so I'm not sure. Danielle, will you be presenting about this in this uh, series? Yes, I think so. Okay, great. So you'll hear much more about the inner workings of this thing, but to make a long story short, it's a wiki, so it's kind of a non-threatening collaborative environment where, where people can go and edit uh, pages. Uh, but under the hood, it's a semantic wiki, so it knows about things like ontologies, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, so we have different um, parts to this. Uh, there's kind of a community focus, there's some Start a startup guides to get people started. Uh, and we have different working groups, uh, primarily to elaborate paleoclinic data standards. Uh, and then of course, we actually have a portal for the data sets themselves. So as of now, we have something like uh, 700 data sets uh, and counting. Um, uh, and many of these actually are associated with uh, this Pages 2K data collection that I was telling you about uh, in the previous slides. Uh, so that was one of the, the big pushes that we did for the Pages 2K community is put all the data on linked earth. Uh, and we could do that in a relatively short amount of time because the data were standardized. Now, why do this? Well, now that all the data is on linked earth, then it can be curated by the community in a much more transparent way. Uh, so I'll tell you about this in a second. So what's under the hood? What's enabling all this integration and this standardization? Um, and this is an ontology. Uh, presumably most of you have heard what ontology is about, uh, but just uh, to go quickly, it's a, it's a way of representing knowledge. So most of you are familiar. Do I need to go over this? I think, I think you're okay giving the quick version of it because most of us have talked about ontologies quite a bit. Agree. Okay, well, maybe I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just skip over this because you're, you're familiar with this. So, uh, so you're probably familiar with the idea of properties and classes, uh, you know, and this is the case where, for example, we would describe a person on the ontology like Danielle. Danielle has an affiliation. He has a name. Um, he has uh, publications associated with his name. And so we represent all these things in the ontology. Um, and we can do the same with data. Uh, with paleoclimate data. And that's the part that actually took quite a bit of time. Uh, so we had this format that we had already uh, whipped up, uh, and it, it is described in this paper, McKay and MLJ 2016. Uh, that's the lipid format, linked paleo data. Uh, and lipid is essentially a collection of uh, different metadata and data living together in harmony. Uh, and so all the data is in a, in a tabular form, so it's actually pretty easy to store and represent. And all the metadata that goes with it is in JSON LD format, and LD stands for linked data. So uh, there is a way to that um, describe all that data semantically. So it can e the definitions can either be internal to the file or they can be linked to an external ontology. And that's what we spent a lot of time doing, in particular Danielle. Um, which is that we had to go fairly deep uh, into conceptualization to build this thing. Um, we based our work upon um, kind of, uh, you know, we always sit on the shoulders of giants. So we based our work on the concept of a proxy system model that was published by Evans et al. fairly recently, uh, where we kind of separate everything in terms of proxy archives, proxy sensors, and proxy observations. I'm not going to get into the details, but I, I can go into that later. And we also have, um, so effectively we have five separate ontologies that are all linked together by this data model of Lipid. And the beauty of this is that this structure is very rigid, it's very stiff, because if you start tinkering around with the structure, you'll break all the codes and you'll break the wiki. 
On the other hand, inside all these you know, five different labels, there's a lot of freedom for the community to contribute new terms and describe them. So that's the basis for what we call managed crowdsourcing. Uh, if you have something that is you know, that has no structure, then um, and you try to have different people collaborate on it, then it's a recipe for disaster. And at the same time, if you have something that's too structured and there's no freedom for the community to contribute, then that's not collaboration. So we came up with this hybrid model where the structure is stiff and uh, is updated only when the uh, kind of the uh, the core group, the core linked earth group, uh, decides that it needs to be updated. But there's a lot of freedom for the community within those bounds to contribute new terms and also new definitions. Um, so this is one representation of the ontology for now. And if you want more, you can follow this link, uh, which I hope still works, and, uh, and look at all the wonderful job that Danielle has done. And I'm not going to go into these details. Uh, so why go through such level of complexity? Uh, I have to admit that it was, or it still is, fairly difficult to sell the paleo community onto doing ontologies. But uh, one of the major uh, motivations is that it allows uh, complex queries. That's one of the major things that they want to do. It allows to do inference, although we're not quite there yet, uh, and things like formal reasoning, which that'll, that's for the future. We're not quite there yet. But we can perform complex queries. Um, and you can go on our GitHub site to view examples of that. Um, okay, so with our Star Trek analogy, essentially the ontology would be like the brain of, uh, of data, the Android. All right, uh, so there's ways to query the data sets in fairly intuitive ways. This is one way of that. Let me switch now to objective number two. How much time do I have, by the way? Five minutes, 10 minutes? Uh, you have 15 minutes, 14 minutes. Okay, well, good. All right, that's perfect. Should be enough to get us through. So the second objective was to develop standards. Uh, uh, so one of them is to make it easy for people to upload and annotate data sets. Um, so the wiki offers a way to do that, that, you know, once somebody creates a lipid file, and we now have uh, relatively low cost ways of doing this, uh, cost in terms of barrier of entry, it's of course free, uh, monetarily speaking, but we're, we're making it easier and easier for people to structure their data like that. And then they can upload it to the wiki in one click, and then they can start adding properties and editing these files and downloading them again. Um, you know, there are, there are some very nice features like tab completions. So if, you start, uh, if you start entering a term, for example, it comes up with a number of suggestions and these suggestions um, help foster standardization so if you're looking for the word identifier or something like that then you can see oh this is the way it's spelled or this is the way it's used you can click on it to see what is the definition in the ontology without having to to look up a complex document um, so it makes it very easy for people to enter the properties um, the other thing is that like all wikis they are discussion pages uh, so uh, this is one case, for example, for uh, the idea of a reference. Uh, and so there's a talk page, which is time stamped and which is uh, where uh, the contributors are identified by name. Uh, and this is useful because often we ask the community to make decisions and there needs to be kind of a public record of what discussion took place and why is it that they took a decision on, you know, why do we call something this way or that way um, and why not something else? Um, so we believe that that's a really nice way of keeping track of discussions. And then finally, we have working groups. Um, and these working groups were created because we realized that there is a lot of diversity in this community and that the people who work with caves, for example, uh, what we call speleothems in this community, they have very different needs and very different cultures than people who work with trees, for instance. And so we wanted to enable each of these working groups to start making decisions and have a discussion space uh, where they could kind of vent these things. Uh, and oh, this was an early day where there weren't too many, <laughs> there were only four members in that group. Now there are a few more, uh, but we spent a lot of the time over the summer coordinating with these working groups uh, and having them put in uh, a lot of what they think. One of the you know, big drivers for these working groups was to say, okay, what do you think is the essential or recommended or optional metadata and data that needs to accompany a data set. So if 
you know, now in the future and for legacy data sets, uh, what level of uh, stringency do we need to impose uh, for people to, to be able to upload their data online? What do we need, what do they need to call things? You know, what terminology do we need to agree on? And, you know, if there is something like, uh, you know, Delta 18 or a certain type of measurements, then what are the standards for reporting the uncertainties and all kinds of things like that. Uh, so instead of having a very broad scale community discussion about this, we kind of narrowed it down to these more focused communities focused around, in that case, different archives. And once again, the capacities of the wiki allow to track discussions and even allows polling. Um, so I'm not sure I have the example here. Maybe, maybe not. Um, oh yeah, here's a, uh, a little uh, video um, where we come scrolling through this page. Uh, and it shows you, uh, first of all, who is a member of that working group, and you can go on the individual page. Um, we kind of charge the working groups with specific tasks, uh, and we ask them to <coughs> uh, to vote uh, on, on different decisions. So I'm going to pass here, but uh, those are the steps uh, that the Linktrif platform is enabling, again, through uh, this wiki platform. Okay, thanks for the warning, Susan. I heard you. Okay, the last part is to enable reproducible workflows. Uh, and to do so, um, this was the part that was actually fun for us, is that once you have data that's very structured, then it's very easy to write code around it to do all kinds of things. Um, and so we have basic functionalities that already exist. We have advanced functionalities that are in the works. Uh, but really, the most basic thing that people want to do with their data is visualize it. Uh, in sort of a, a rigorous way. And this is one example of, if you have a data set that's on the wiki uh, and it kind of passed muster, passed basic quality control, then you can immediately feed it to uh, this particular Python package that we developed and visualize it. You can do a, kind of, a lot of other things to it, um, but you know, one, one day we, we hope to enable cloud-based visualization and things like this, so that data can really live in the cloud and people can just in one click, uh, visualize uh, what it is that they are looking at in the cloud. Um, there's other uh, softwares that we're developing in R. This is one called Geocon R, uh, and that addresses the need for the community to really deal with time uncertainties. Um, and so this is a particular Python package that mostly uh, Nick McKay, uh, another climate scientist on this grant, has developed. And uh, we've uh, you know, just concluded a training workshop a couple of weeks ago, second training workshop on this, uh, which is attracting a lot of attention. So the point is that, that we're developing a code base uh, for people to do science with Lipid. Uh, so Lipid is both the structure that underlies Linked Earth and the Linked Earth Wiki, uh, but it's also a data format that is starting to be really useful in, in doing science. Uh, so. That was a big, uh, I know, building those three elements was a, a key element of Linked Earth. Uh, and I would say that we, we have succeeded in doing that. Um, so Linked Earth can now empower field scientists to do these three things. Uh, curate their own data sets, build data standards that work for them. Uh, so have an input in, in that process. It's not something that a government agency has decided on, it's something that it's that paleo climate scientists themselves can do. And then um, we can easily connect these data sets to cutting edge data and, uh, analysis, uh, analysis tools. So to conclude, um, modern and future paleo, giant, paleo science requires integration, uh, both of data sets, data sets with models, with people, and also scientific cultures. The basis for that, although it's not the be all end all, but it's definitely the basis, is to have interoperable data. And that's obviously a key goal of EarthCube, is, is to make data interoperable within communities and between communities. Uh, I would argue that the challenge that we have in our community is not so much that the data are big, is that they are broad, meaning that they're very diverse. One of the ways that we have, or that we are addressing this challenge is through geoinformatics. So Linked Earth 
uh, help foster a data container, which is lipid. It helped foster an ontology, which is a very formal way of representing this data container. Uh, and a semantically enabled platform, which is a Linktrith wiki, that allows people to interact with these data sets in, a, in an intuitive way. Uh, and once you have your data in, in this format, then you have a bunch of cutting edge analysis tools that essentially come for free. So all of this requires standardization, and standardization is obviously something that requires a lot of community participation. Uh, so Linktruth has really planted the seed for that in terms of developing a platform to do that, but we are still having problems kind of motivating the community uh, into investing time in this, and that's because it's perceived as interfering with doing science, right? So if you are participating in this standardization process, it's taking away from um, the, um, the normalized or it's, you know, the, uh, the accepted worthy practices that a scientist should be doing, which is to publish papers. Uh, so we're still having a little bit of, uh, of a hard time motivating the community. Definitely we've had success with, I think the younger members of the community realize how important this is and are willing to put in their time. Uh, but it's been definitely more challenging trying to recruit more senior members of the community and convincing them that this is a worthwhile use of their time. Uh, so I'll be happy to discuss uh, the questions uh, about uh, the next few steps that we can take. And I'll stop here. Terrific. Julian, thank you. That, that was terrific and very well presented and well organized. I really appreciated how much time and thought you put into sequencing each of the slides so that we can follow your ideas in a really clear and succinct manner. That was beautiful, actually. Um, Thank you. So we'll open it up to questions. And I have, I have a question, but I'll hold my question till the end. Does anyone um, have a question for our speaker? Well, I also have a question, but I can, I can wait until <laughs> if someone else has, has additional comments, too. I have a question. Okay. I'll turn the picture on too. See, I mean, I, I leave for a flight in about 15 minutes and I've been having my picture off so I could get things together as I listened. Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so thank you very much. That was really interesting. And uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is um, how much you're depending on other people to actually change the structure of their data to coordinate with your formalism and how much you're working on translators that will allow people to connect to you? Uh, excellent question. So most people in this community are familiar with Excel, but they usually, you know, there's no format. I mean, Excel is just an empty container for data and they all structure it in, in different ways. Uh, so one of the things that we have offered them is, a, is an Excel template so that uh, they can start putting their data essentially in the right boxes and with the right names. And then um, we've written some codes, uh, mostly in Python, where they can, uh, if they know Python, they can translate the data into the Lipid format. We're now working on something much more intuitive that's web-based, um, and that's kind of takes the user by the hand in terms of, of generating those data. And uh, the, Incentive for people to do so is, other than the things I've mentioned here, is that we've worked with repositories like, for example, the National, Cent National Climatic Data Center um, has a, you know, NOAA, NOAA Paleo, as it's called. It's, it's under the aegis of the National Centers for Environmental Information. Now they are beginning to accept Lipid as a valid submission format. Uh, so we, we've built translators that essentially allow them behind the scenes to take a Lipid file and put it into the form that they like for internal storage. <laughs> uh, and we're doing the same thing with uh, uh, the, the European counterpart called Pangea, that's also a big database that stores this kind that's of... That's a huge database. Yes, so we're not quite there yet because we don't have, you know, quite this... They don't have the same incentives to work with us as NOAA does, and, you know, because we're funded by the U.S., but... I think uh, that's ultimately where we want to go with this, and they've indicated that they are interested in doing so. So, you know, for us, the, the point is that if we can convince the community to spend a few extra minutes uh, structuring their data into Lipid, then they can very easily send it to a bunch of 
repositories that are going to take it like that, so, and they can also update, uh, upload it onto Linked Earth. That's great. Hi, Amy. Hi, I'm, I have to apologize. I had a family emergency, so I'm so sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm glad you're sorry to hear that. Hi, Amy. Hello. I missed everything, but I can look up your talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is Yolanda. Can I add something very quickly? Of course. Just to mention that um, the platform is pretty domain dependent. So we've been uh, using it for uh, neuroscience uh, data uh, integration, and um, we're interested in, in other communities that might be uh, willing to give it a try. Um, there's no other framework that plays its role in the science ecosystem of helping scientists uh, design standards as they collaborate. So um, the, the platform itself is open source and uh, we're happy to collaborate with others if you're interested. Just wanted to mention that. That was a great talk, Julian. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hopefully I did justice to all the enormous amount of work that goes into building this. It looks deceptively simple, but under the hood, it's quite complicated. You gave a beautiful soft pitch to Danielle and Yolanda for when they, they come and give their presentation and teach us how, how everything works. Yeah, and, uh, and actually, there are things that are pretty cool because now, now that the content is structured, the wiki may not be the only means of, of presenting this information to users, right? And one of the things that they, they were, this type of platform allows is that it um, exposes all the information through a public API. So, for example, I spent some time last week with Deborah just doing a Python notebook that, uh, that did the typical queries that a user may be wanting to do uh, within a Python notebook because they are, that is what they are more used to, right? Rather than doing a query in the wiki or so on. Uh, so it, it can be uh, the it can be adapted to all the paradigms that we are used to, and I think that that is very powerful as well. That's very cool. Does anyone else have another question? I want. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I wanted to just ask, can you help me understand the one slide in particular? You have the discussion about the proxy archives, the proxy sensors, et cetera. Yes. Can you explain what that concept is of the proxy archives and sensors? And it's so proxy data sets, basically, right? But is it proxy because you're treating historical data as if they were sensors? Um, okay, <laughs> so that is, yeah, that's a good question and we actually spent a lot of time defining those terms. Uh, ultimately, they were defined by a group called Supranet uh, maybe 10 years ago and that Evan Sedal in, in that uh, QSR paper merely reused that terminology. Um, if you're familiar, uh, what kind of paleo data are you familiar with? Um, invertebrate paleontology from my undergraduate days, so... Um... Okay, so that's yeah. a great example. That's actually what we have right here. So if you look at a forum, yeah. uh, when people measure, for example, when they try to reconstruct past sea, sea surface temperature variation, often what they do is they measure the magnesium calcium ratio. Yeah. In, oh, in yeah. Okay, so here you have a picture of our friend G. Ruber, which is one such uh, in, right. you know, okay. unicellular organism. So the proxy observation in this case is magnesium calcium. Uh, the thing that you measure it on, um, I mean, you measure it in, inside a sediment core, uh, so the, the archive is a sediment, uh, oh, okay. but the, sens okay. the sensor itself was the organism. The organism was sensing changes in climate. Uh, so, you know, that's how we define sensor. And in fact, uh, we reused a lot of the SSN. Uh, there's an ontology already for a uh, thing called, uh, called sensor or something network. Um, the SSN ontology and uh, what we, we spent, or Danielle spent a lot of time making sure that all of the concepts that we created as part of Linked Earth, we created essentially as, as few new concepts as we could, that we would reuse as many other concepts as we could. So for example, for all the names and things like that, we used the friend of a friend ontology because that's the most standard way that people understand this concept of mm -hmm. person, name and affiliation and so on. 
so that was one part that was original that we had to add these concepts because there's no other ontology um, that we were aware of like Suite or Envo or all these other ones that uh, are currently available. None of them had these concepts. Um, but we, we, you know, we didn't create them out of nothing. We, we reused a terminology that is now, you know, I wouldn't say it's broadly accepted. Uh, it definitely, it took, a, you know, we, we had a really nice uh, workshop on data standards last year in Boulder uh, where you know, we had some, something like 30 or 40 participants. And we, we had an activity uh, where we asked people to define some of these terms. And at first, uh, one of my colleagues was saying, you know, I hate these terms. I you know that's not a really good name at all. And then after about 15 minutes, he said, I take back everything I said. Um, you know, these terms are awful, but they are less worse than anything else we could come up <laughs> with. <laughs> and that's the way that, you know, we, we, I mean, for us, you know, creating ontologies was an entirely new process. And we definitely, at least the climate scientists on the team learned a lot from that. But what we ended up concluding was that uh, an ontology works when everybody is maximally uncomfortable with with a term. That it's not just one person who's super happy about a term and everybody else is unhappy, but when everybody is equally uncomfortable with something, then you start getting somewhere. Uh, and we argued a lot of over things, but eventually we come to a place where the, the framework is very solid. It, it doesn't break. Uh, and and you know, we try we've had a few tests lately where different types of, of proxy data were added to this. And we've been pretty amazed at how easy it is to fit other things in that framework. It's not always natural, but it's possible. And I think that's right. it. And so the, and the idea too then is the proxy, I guess, so a piece of proxy information does need to come from, well, I guess it's just, a, it's not a, a, a natural measurement. So, it's a type of measurement, but it's a measurement that's indirectly related to climate. And yeah. ontology yeah. describes how it's related to climate. Okay, so it's a proxy in relation to climate. So, okay, I'll, I'll have to look at it more and may have more questions because it's an interesting, those are interesting concepts. And the proxy observation and archive seem to make intuitive sense, but the proxy sense... Proxy sensor also, when you explained it, makes intuitive sense, but it's a little bit harder to wrap my head around. And then I'll probably have to look at it to understand how it could translate over to other areas and think about it. So that's interesting. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that, that one is fairly paleo specific, uh, but mm -hmm. climate is not the only thing that proxies can sense, right? If you think about paleo ecology, they also use, for example, pollens as a way of kind of sensing yeah. the dynamics of an ecosystem. Um, so, you know, right. we have categories that there for. And geochemical uh, si signatures of any kind. It's interesting. Yeah, to just so, yeah, so like you're a stalagmite or a stalactite can be your proxy sensor, and you can take the relationships that you measure there as a proxy observation. And the proxy archive, I guess, anyway, I guess the <laughs> ring in the stalactite or stalagmite would be the proxy sensor the stalactite itself would be the proxy archive and the proxy yeah. observation would be the measurement of that you collect from the rings. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. You, you're a quick learner. So yeah. So for every single example, um, that's, that's how we had to go through them. Uh, and when we, there were, you know, quite a few examples where we, we started to argue, you know, the, definitely the one that made us the most uncomfortable was ice. Because the sensor for ice is the atmosphere, uh, so you know an ice core. Okay, that's your archive. You you know you yeah. take core, but what it's made of ice and that ice fell from the sky and so that the sky was your sensor. <laughs> so that one is very weird. But others like the forams or coral, you know that those were like the living organisms that were experiencing climate. Yeah. Those were, were were relatively intuitive uh, and it makes sense when you explain them to people. And, but one, I, I will say one of the things that we learned the most of is having to explain those things to somebody like Danielle, who was in charge of actually making the ontology. And he kept asking us, okay, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? And so it forced us to be extremely disciplined about the way we use these terms. And to me, that's one of the main values of this project that we did come up with an ontology like this. I hope other people are gonna use it uh, because it was a tremendous amount of work to create. Uh, but I think, uh, at least for us, it really allowed us to crystallize our thinking um, in, in a much clearer manner uh, that, 
that almost anybody has attempted. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. That's neat. Uh, it, Danielle, I know you said you had a question. Does anyone else, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but anyone else have any questions? I would just say, no, I'm super, super curious about what it's all about. So my question is, when is that going to be online so that I can look at it? <laughs> oh, no, Everything is online. Well, it depends what part you mean. The deontology is online. A lot of the links I mean, are... I mean the talk, today's talk, that because I was recorded. Okay, so Danielle has already captured, so she's capturing me very, very soon. Like, I'll do it this week. Great. Can you, can you the slides are already online. If you go in the chat box, for example, in Zoom, right okay. on the right hand side, I posted Great. a link to a Google Drive, um, and, and you can access the, the PDF. Um, cool. Thank you. Sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been a really, really nice talk, and I'm very yeah. appreciative of, of you taking the time to present to our group. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, I mean, I mean, <laughs> Do I have the time for that question, or we are we are uh, a little past through the time? So, um, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So, yes. um, what what would you what would you say it has uh, worked and not worked to engage the community? Ah, yeah, good question. Good question. Um, I would say you know the challenge is definitely we we thought uh, that uh, the wiki would be an incredibly simple tool. Um, that nobody would have an issue with wiki in the way that they would have, for example, with running Python or some kind of other code. And I was surprised that in this community, which is definitely not very tech savvy, even wiki was intimidating to people. Hmm. Um, so that's definitely been a challenge. Uh, the other thing, again, is, is this, the biggest difficulty which we knew about ahead of time is the uh, going against the grain of what academics are being taught, that they're just supposed to publish papers all the time and write proposals, but they're not supposed to do things like this because there's not a great reward structure. So we try to make a reward structure, which I didn't really show, but you know about. So, you know, there's a, a place on the web page where you can see where everybody's contributions are. And actually, Danielle um, has worked with some interns at ISI to build these weekly reports that kind of tell you in the last seven days so many edits have been done by so and so and so there's a way to kind of highlight the good citizens uh, highlight their contributions and hopefully um, you know that can be used uh, for rewards uh, but of course you know the whole academic reward system has to be aware of that mm -hmm. uh, so that's one part that we can't change overnight well, in, in, many, in many other communities, also just coming up with the standard uh, uh, in the end becomes a very important publication too, right? So maybe, um, I don't know, maybe a convincing people that that is a valuable effort because in the end it is, I mean, when, when you are working in a field and, they, and people see that your name is on the standard that everyone is using in the field, then that, that should also give you like some cachet. <laughs> Exactly. And that's what we're working on now because papers are the only currency that we really have. And so we're working on two papers, one describing the ontology itself, which is, you know, mostly for the geoinformatics crowd, which is not a very big one, as you all know. Uh, but we're also working on a, an actual paleo paper that's all about describing the results of what these working groups decided. Uh, so uh, what decisions the people came up with and how many people were involved in there and where, you know, the authorship for that one will be extremely large. Uh, the barrier to entry will be very low so that there's a lot of community buy-in and hopefully, uh, you know, a standard is as much about the definitions as it is about uses. So if nobody uses a standard, it's not a standard. So yeah. we're trying to have people uh, put it to active use. I see. Um... Yeah, I, th those were my questions. Thanks again for, for the talk. It has been great having you today. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to showcase this. And uh, yeah, let me know in the future meetings when you're going to give more details about all this. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, everyone, we'll see you all next month. And um, in the meantime, we'll see you in between. Um, I've been getting phone calls from people who are signing up for ISGU. I got a call from an undergraduate and a graduate student the other day that heard about things that we've been doing at conferences. So that's exciting. And uh, they wanted to know more and they found our information on the website. So 
keep talking and uh, I will get to work on the recordings and the, and the uh, PowerPoints and I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Danielle and I uh, round that out together. And I appreciate your help right. by the way, Danielle. And uh, thank you everybody, Julian, especially thank you so much for a fantastic talk and everybody no have worries. a great week. Okay. Thanks.